So it's a question of obedience. Um, that's what's so important in the gospel that we give. That it's not a question of sins. Sins were paid for. It's a question of will you accept? Will you accept that gift? Will you have the blood applied to you? The sins have been paid for. So, condemned to death and in need of, rep- of redemption. So being dead to sin does not mean that the sin has lost its appeal for believers. It will be a source of temptation as long as we live. Romans chapter 7. Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter, turn to Romans chapter 7 with me. Starting in verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. For if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells in me. We look back to chapter 6 and we're supposed to be dead to sin. But yet Paul in uh, another place asks, why do you continue to walk in it? If you are dead to sin, why do you continue to walk in it? That we should have, when we received salvation, we, put, we should have nailed our sins to the cross, our sin nature to the cross, and yet we still struggle with it. Because that sin nature is in these fallen bodies, and yet our spirits, our human spirits, are made alive. So it is still a temptation as long as we live. It is still a struggle. Um, and not just the flesh. The world and the, the flesh and the devil is what we struggle with. And yet, we are called to resist. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood and you're striving against sin. We have to understand that in, in Romans. Paul is not saying, yeah, give up. Should we just go on sinning? May it never be. That our, our striving to stay in fellowship, um, to stay filled with the Holy Spirit, is for our benefit and for Christ's glory. God is holy, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And every one of His ways is perfect. First John 1 John 1.5 says, This is the message that we have heard from Him and announced to you, that God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. James 1.17 says, Every good thing and, per- and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, and with whom there is no variation or shifting of shadow. God is perfect, that means he, he cannot change. He cannot improve. He cannot get better. There's no variation or shifting of shadow. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sin is that which proves unlike the character of God, and so is an offense against his character. The death of Christ was a ransom paid to redeem us from sin and death. 1 Timothy 2.6 says, Who gave himself as a ransom for all? The testimony given at the proper time. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to his riches in grace. Is that a sufficient definition for sin, do you think? Sin is that which proves unlike the character of God and so is an offense against his character? Let's sit on that for another week. I'll ask the question of the week. Why don't you guys think about that and pray about that? Is that a definition of sin that's clear enough for us to understand? Sins were laid on Christ. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Did you get that? will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin. That second time of salvation that he appears, sin is done away with. The sin, of, the sin nature in us is done away with. But he's not coming with reference to sin 
that's already been taken care of. That's already been paid for. The righteousness of God was laid on us at the moment of salvation. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 says, But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction. Sins were nailed to the cross with Christ, were paid for by his death, and his righteousness was laid on us. That seems like a very uneven, unfair trade, right? It isn't fair. But we're the ones who benefit from it. That was the best deal that ever transpired on this, this planet. That though we were deserving of death and still deserving of death, yet Christ paid an unfathomable penalty. How many humans have ever lived on this planet? How many humans are living on this planet now? And how many humans will be born before the rapture occurs? And yet every single sin of all of those people was paid for, past, present, and future. Every sin was paid for. Every sin was dealt with. Every sin was thrown behind God's back that he would never look at them again. At the moment of salvation, the new believer becomes positionally righteous in Christ, sanctified in Christ, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit. But by his word, you are in Christ Jesus, who came who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.2 The church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified, been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Such of you... Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. That's another aspect of salvation that some people forget. That we were sanctified. At the moment of salvation, we were sanctified. That sanctification is done because that sanctification and righteousness comes from Christ. He does not need to improve. There is a sanctification of our walk as we walk in a manner worthy of that we received. But our sanctification was perfected as far as our, our human spirits were concerned at the moment of salvation. This is the fun part, sort of. Uh, okay, maybe not, Father. And you got a little arrogant there. <laughs> you made me lose my place. Uh, where are we? Okay. There is a difference between sanctified and sanctimonious. Mark chapter 11, verse 25. It says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father who is in heaven will forgive you of your transgressions. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. The tax collector was beating his breast saying, Be propitious to me, O God. There's another type of that kind of sanctimonious that we still see. Unfortunately, we see it um, in evangelism today. Evangelism is not standing on a street corner preaching hatred and a gospel of moral reform to sons of disobedience and children of wrath. They can't be fixed. They can only be reborn. Ephesians chapter 2 keeps coming up as an example of this fallen world. It is, it is it's an example of fallen man. And when you stand on a, pre, on a street corner holding up signs that say God hates, that's why they forgot John 
God doesn't hate. He hates sins. But He loves the sinners. He loves us. It is preaching Christ and Him crucified to a lost and dying world and proclaiming the free gift of salvation by grace through faith and forgiveness of sins and eternal life in His name. That's evangelism. I'll say that again. It is preaching Christ and Him crucified to a lost and dying world and proclaiming the free gift of salvation by grace through faith and forgiveness of sins and eternal life in His name. In His name. The new believer needs to know fully what is meant by it is finished. The new believer needs to know fully the duration of eternal life. The new believer needs to know fully the security of his salvation and that there is nothing he can do or indeed even that God could do to reverse the justification he has been given. Salvation is permanent, secure, and finished. John 10, chapter, I'm sorry, John chapter 10, verse 28 says, And I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Pastor Bob has taught this several times that you would have to have First of all, we know that we're held in Jesus' hand. Jesus tells us, oh, you're held in the Father's hand too. So now you have triple, or now you have double omniscience. It would require of you to get yourself out of God's hands. John chapter 19, verse 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he, and, uh, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Hebrews 10.14 says, by, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. In order for you to lose your salvation, God would have to undo everything that he's done and everyone would have to lose their salvation. And if God tells us, 1 John chapter 5, you who have the Son, you have the life. If God gives us what he calls a gift, and says, you weren't deserving of this and I'm going to give you this gift anyway. And then later comes back because we have sinned, we've stumbled and says, I'm going to take my gift back because, wait a minute, you're still not worthy. You weren't worthy to begin with, you're not worthy now. That's why it's a gift. I think this is a good place to stop. This we're a 10 after, 11 after, 7. And it will probably take another 15 to 20 minutes to get through parapatology. So we'll save that for next week. So remember, for next week, I want you guys to think about, as I do, if that definition of sin is sufficient. Um, Read it again to you. Yes, sin is that which proves unlike the character of God and so is an offense against his character. Think about that. We'll look at it again next week. And once again, read your Bibles. Start in Leviticus this time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and faithfulness, for your mercy and love. And Father, you are merciful. Father, the the sins that were forgiven on the cross, the unimaginable amount. And yet your son was so perfect and so worthy and so spotless and so full of love and willing to take those sins upon him. And Father, we thank you that your mercy extends not only to our salvation but to, but to our sanctification and to our Christian lives as we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. And Father, once again, I ask you, increase our capacity and increase our hunger and our thirst. For those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will satisfy. Father, give us all we can handle and then help us to handle more, that we might be saturated in your word and your truth. The message that went forth tonight, I ask that you would sanctify it in the hearts of those who heard, including me, and that you would make it real to us. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name, amen.